Yes. Yes, the wash and fluff. Oh, I love it when he gets... I mean, he smells so good when he comes home. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank, oh. Uh, oh, my God. It's, look, it's me talking to a groomer. No, no like the dog groomer. The dog... My goodness, it's me, Mrs. Kasha Davis. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Auntie, where I get the opportunity to talk to movers, shakers, entrepreneurs, and motivators. And today is no different. We have so much to talk about. We're going to get right into it. Hi, Tim. Oh, my goodness. Hello, <laughs> Mrs. Kasha Davis. You just look at you and your sparkly blouse. I know. Today was sparkly blouse day, I guess. I am telling you right now. That Everybody, this is Tim Evanicki, and we have so many different things to talk about. We have our business partnership. We have your story of just your theater story, your business story, and your health triumphs. Mm. Oh well, my yes, thank gosh. you. Gosh, well, you want to get off the horn? I, I would, yes. Let's get off the horn. All right. Okay. And here's the great thing. This is the great thing. Look at that. Wow. Oh my god. Technology. Goodness. The magic of podcasts. Well, the magic of podcasts and the magic of modern technology here at rockvox.com, uh, uh, rockvox productions, etc. We have only the finest technology and it comes with butterflies. And that's the thing right here. So many. So many butterflies. Not They're butterflies beautiful. like nerves, butterflies like uh, beautiful spiritual stuff. And that's what I think sometimes with these conversations, you never know where they're, they're going to lead and how they're going to help other people. And I am so thrilled to have had the opportunity to get to know you. I mean, in so many different ways, we have things in common. And uh, I think we're balancing each other out quite well with some of our business ventures. But let me first tell you, I or first ask you, did you uh, receive your pearl necklace this morning from your husband? Or how, what, tell me a little bit about the pearls. What's going on over there? Oh, I always like to class up my outfits with a nice, sensible pearl necklace. You know who else did that? Who? Tina Turner. Oh, well. Yes. She would have her little shimmy dress on and then pearls because oh. she was a lady. Yeah. And that's like me. Like, I have my Liza Minnelli coat on today because I'm a lady. Yeah. And I have my pearls on because I'm a lady. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why. <laughs> okay. First and foremost, theater background. Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit. Where did you go to school? What did you do? What, what were some of your... Your theater highlights. Yeah, I actually grew up pretty close by where we are right now in Rochester. I grew up in Hanoi, about 45 minutes south of here, and was always very active in theater in school and, and in the Rochester area. I went to Eastman School of Music for voice lessons in high school. And then um, after uh, graduating, I went to Juilliard. Oh my and it uh, was a major in vocal performance there. And everyone's always like, oh my gosh, Juilliard. But um, Juilliard wasn't the right school for me. Oh, really? And yeah, I um, I went to the school with the biggest name and uh, not the school that was going to give me everything that I wanted to get out of it. Mm. It didn't have academics uh, like I wanted to have. It didn't have musical theater. It was classical voice. And classical voice was something that I did well, but it wasn't something that I was passionate about. So uh, later in life, uh, when now I own a company called The College Audition, um, and that's what made me so passionate about um, about helping students find the right school for them uh, is because I didn't, um, and I don't let them get clouded just by the big name. I love that. Yeah, I didn't. Now it's, we've we've had so many different things that we've been working on, and I've never really had the opportunity to dive deep into that passion and why yeah. why yeah. you're doing the audition, the college audition business. I mean. It's fascinating. I had the opportunity to perform uh, and to do a, it was a karaoke night. It was just yep. a fun night with Darian Lake. And uh, we were with the students and they were just so enthusiastic. And I just remember when I was a little boy, girl, gal, girl, boy, fella, back in the high school days, that that was my community. Mm -hmm. These were my people. Is that your experience from high school? Absolutely. I'm still very, very good friends with the kids I did theater with in high school. And and I love seeing that now. Like, I love that um, the company that I own is is the thing that brings these kids together. Right. Um, and they're all meeting each other now. Um, I'm just starting with my new class right now, my juniors. Um, and I'm telling them all, you know, this is going to be your family, not just for the next year, but, you know, through college. We have kids that um, are now college roommates that met each other at oh, our at our program. Um, so it, 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 they don't quite understand how much, the, you know, the performing arts really can bond to people mm -hmm. um, because we really go through things that nobody else goes through and experience things that nobody else experiences. So having other people that are like-minded and experiencing the things you're experiencing always help. 
Well, it's about community. Yeah, always. It's always about community for me, and I'm realizing this as I, well, just recently turned 53, <laughs> Grandma Davis, Auntie, Auntie, <laughs> um, Auntie Davis. But no, the idea that you can look at a hockey team or any other sports ball and and theater and see the dynamic of community, of mm -hmm. the teamwork, of lifting each other up. And I think it's really fascinating that uh, – you took some of uh, an experience that you had with regard to your education and your performance and said, you know what? I want to help others to maybe not, maybe they will make a, make a decision to choose a certain school, but to help them to maybe not maybe do, go down a road that you went down, et cetera. Now, what was Juilliard like though? So you're saying that it was classic. Just yeah. classic voice. And th yeah. that's this is like more like opera? Is this yeah. what you're saying? It was studying opera. And and when I got to Juilliard and for the first few years or a couple of years at Juilliard, um, everything that I heard from them was that you're too musical theater, you're too musical theater. Cut that oh, out. Gosh. You're too musical theater. Um, so my last recital uh, that I did there, I worked my butt off. Like I did every coaching, every voice lesson I could to prepare for this. And and they all kind of congratulated me and shook my hand saying, that's it. You've got it. That the, the musical theater kid's gone. And I was like, oh, like, I don't oh. think I like that. And then went out into the real world and started auditioning. And and the feedback that I got was that I was too classical. So, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I love that you're sharing this because all too often we get told to suppress a certain way about ourselves or uh, whether it's, you know, the way that you're singing, obviously your gender or your your sexuality or yeah. any of these things. Like you're too you're too sparkly, you're too fan. My parent, my father used to say you're too fancy, you're too frilly. And look at me now. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> these are things. Or even in the drag world, you get told things like you have to. The only thing, the only way is RuPaul's Drag Race. The only way, even at a at a local club, is to do the top forty song. Not true. Mm -mm. If you're most authentic to yourself. And doing what you love, other people are going to want in. Yeah, I tell my kids that all the time too. When they're um, learning a new song or, or 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 doing a new monologue or something, they always tend to copy what they've heard. And you know, and I'll remind them often that that's not what the little black dots on the page said. You're <laughs> singing what you heard Ben Platt sing, and I'll say, well, guess what? There's already a Ben Platt, and if you're just going to be a Ben Platt mimic, you're not going to be successful because they don't need another Ben Platt. They need a you. Right. Yeah. And so the the classes, the preparation is to help them to find the right place to audition and then also to, what to do in that audi audition. Yeah. So we um, do both the artistic audition side of things, but we also do the academic application coaching. So students will come to me and start working with me as a junior um, in full-time coaching. We have underclassmen coaching as well, but they start full-time coaching as a junior and the very first thing we do is start to build a list of colleges that they're going to start to pursue. Um, and so our first meeting is a huge game of 20 questions. I, mm -hmm. I ask them everything about themselves um, uh, academically. I talk to the parents about financially. Um, what do you, I even ask like, who do you hang out in, at, with at school? Are you hanging out with just theater kids or do you hang out with kids in, that in, in sports and things like that too? Because that'll tell me the kind of learning environment that they're going to grow in. I tell kids all the time, you're going to grow wherever you're planted. It's just my job to find the place that you're going to be planted where you can grow to your fullest potential. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll develop a list of, of colleges um, and then start writing essays. Um, musical theater kids still have to get accepted academically and right. follow the same academic rigor that, that any other major does. So um, we they have to sometimes write 30 and 40 essays because musical theater kids are applying to 20 colleges. Mm -hmm. um, then we help them with their videos for their um, pre-screen auditions and through their live uh, auditions. And right now for my class of 2024, it's all about financial aid appeals. And we do that process with them as well. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into this. Yeah. More than I really realized. And I'm sure the parents aren't involved at all. They're, they're not like... Um... <laughs> Imagine parents are very excited for their their kids, and yes. they have an idea. I mean, I remember, you know, my mother. No matter what you told her, I was going on Broadway. And mm -hmm. I mean, let's face the facts. You know, my voice. It's at most a character voice, and no. And I'm saying that just whatever. It's fine, but I don't have the type of training that a lot of people have. And my mother, no matter what, 
Oh my God, mm-hmm. he's a star, nah. you know. And so you you've got to wrangle parents, I'm sure, a lot, and that is that has yeah. got to be pretty funny. Yeah, the 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 parents are really the client, um, and I think I spend just as much time talking parents off ledges than I do talking kids off ledges, if not more. Um, and the funny part about the industry, which I I still fully admit that I think it's crazy that this is even an industry where kids need a coach to get through this process. The, the industry has changed so much just in recent years because there's these online parent groups now um, where the parents are all exchanging notes. Mm. And all that's doing is making the parents and the students immediately compare their path with everyone else's path. Okay, And that's causing so many problems because a school doesn't necessarily release all of their answers all at one time. So then it's... Well, CCM just told everyone that got the, these yeses went out. How come they didn't call me yet? I obviously, and then it just causes this avalanche of emotion. And, and, and for a lot of these kids too, it's the first time that they're out of their little hometown bubble. Right. And this happens at my my program too, where they're actually put on a stage, literally and figuratively, with kids from all over the country. Mm-hmm. And it's an eye opener for them because they may be the best in their hometown. And they may have a million people always telling them, oh, my God, you're going to be a star. You're going to be on Broadway. When in in reality, that may not be where they are right now. And if that's not if, if they're not right for a Carnegie Mellon or a University of Michigan right now, it doesn't mean they're not going to make it on Broadway. Most people on Broadway didn't go to one of those big, big schools. Right. There's uh, different paths. He, exactly. And the parents, you know, I have some parents that I. I see once at the consultation and then not again till auditions. And I have other parents that are there every step of the way. And I, I work with both. Right. But I think so many times the parents um, just have to let the kid experience this too. If they have to hold their hand every step of the way, they're not ready to go off to college. They're going to go to college and right. be on their own. Yeah. And there and there needs to be the joy, especially with, I believe, with performance. Yeah. If you're not loving it, then the audience isn't loving it. If you're exactly. doing it for your parents or for someone else and for their approval, it's, it's going to show through. And then worst case scenario that I have learned. And again, it's taken me time. And you, there are people like yourself as a coach, as a mentor to help people, the comparison kind of factor in our minds can just ruin us yep. because there, everyone is special in their own way and bring something to the table and there are so many different things and different factors why people are selected. And sometimes mm-hmm. it, the, these things are so important and in, in fostering that. And so I think it's, as a step-parent, I think sometimes one of the biggest lessons learned is to allow your child to go through whatever it is they're going through and learn and just to be there as a support. You want to just be like, this is what didn't work for me or this is what I'm learning over here and I just want to share this with you. And honestly, sometimes it's just the process alone that is the biggest. It's really important that the kids get the no as well. It's important that they get the rejection and face the rejection because that's what a big part of this industry is. And if they have to learn how to deal with it now, once they get out into the real world, it's mostly rejection. It's mostly no. It's mostly no. And it's work. And so there are those people, Darian likes to call it the lightning in the bottle. Like, you know, if we'd look at the drag world, you get somebody like Bianca or Trixie who's like, boom, they're successful. And if you speak to them, they're like, I realize it's not lost on me how lucky I am. And then the majority of the rest of everyone else is out there working. And those experiences, I mean, I always knew that I would be more of a character. And sometimes it just takes life to happen. Mm-hmm. And to experience certain things in order to to be able to emote the way I should or need to on stage. And so some of these students, I bet, like you said, will skyrocket and maybe not even necessarily go to a, 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 a university or a college and, and go and get on Broadway. And others, mm-hmm. the experience of going to college is going to help them down the road to do the best community theater performance exactly. or whatever. And the love of performance exactly. in theater. Exactly. I tell... Um, I tell parents and students all the time, you know, they always drill into the, the kids' heads that you need a backup plan in this industry. You have to have something to fall back on. You need to have a, a double major in another more 
uh, conventional degree, which I hear all the time. And I actually don't feel like a backup plan is the right answer because if you have a backup plan, that's what you're going to end up doing mm-hmm. because right. this, because the entertainment industry is hard. Uh, and, and when you graduate from college, you're going to be poor and living in New York City for a while. But it's not because you have a degree in theater. That's because you're right out of college living in New York City. <laughs> right. You had a degree in accounting and had to move to New York City right away. You'd, you'd be poor there, too. Um, but I think it's unfair that for musical theater students or theater students or entertainers at 17 years old, because there's such a perceived level of failure at 17 years old, we ask that kid to tell us exactly what they're going to be Ugh. when they grow up. And for most of the parents, I turn to them and say, are you doing exactly what you thought you would be when you were 17? Probably not. So let the kid go to school and pursue theater or musical theater. If it's not for them, they're going to get there and realize that for the first time in their life, this is a job. It's right. not just something where they stand up on stage and get clapped at. There are deadlines and things that you have to do. It's a job. And they'll come to their own conclusion while they're at school that maybe there's a different path within the performing arts that you want to take. Maybe they decide that they want to go into arts marketing or arts management. Or I have kids who are talent agents. I have kids who combined the arts with medicine and they now do drama therapy and help kids work through trauma using theater games, which I think is really great. That is really great. I have kids who are going to who are teachers now. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I'm old. Um, you are and, not. <laughs> Please. So I think if we if we try to make them determine their finish line so early, then if they don't reach that finish line, they're going to feel like they failed. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm like, still figuring it out. Exactly. Yes. And and we st- that's just what life does. Your career moves and changes. Who knew I would be doing drag? I didn't know I'd be doing drag. I knew I liked fancy things, and obviously you do too. Uh, so first and foremost, when you left uh, in school and went on, did you do some performing? Did you do some touring? What did you do? I did. I actually moved to Orlando, Florida uh, uh-huh. and worked for the mouse. Uh, oh, how fun. Yeah. Um, and while I was there, I, I also opened a voice studio and and sort of became a, a, a go-to musical theater voice coach in the area. And um, I, I realized quickly that theme park work was not something I wanted to be my full-time job. As much but a as, great experience, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I... I loved, especially around the holidays, I loved working at theme parks. And I even went back later on um, to to work at Universal Studios uh, for Grinchmas. And I was the narrator for the Grinchmas show oh, um, for a couple of years. Just because that was a feel-good right. holiday job. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I was working in the, uh, the, uh, on my voice studio and um, did some performing while I was down there. And, um, as, as I said, I just kept the doors open, and, and every time one opened, I walked through it. Mm-hmm. I produced theater for a while. That's how I first met you. I know, and it was a fancy <laughs> show. It was a fancy adult show. No, it was. this was the Bathhouse the Musical. Yeah. And yeah. If, if you know what a bathhouse is, then you know what a bathhouse is. If you don't know... Well, just would we, would, would we call it a men's club yes. where there's probably no working out? I think they're called athletic clubs. Athletic right? clubs <laughs> where the, you know people go to meet at least right. for 15 minutes, maybe. Right. Uh, my favorite story about this is that we, Aggie and I came to see the show, and I wore a blue towel and a blue head wrap, towel head wrap or whatever it was, and then you know we just walked in and, and we were in drag and the actors have a song or a moment where they talk about the person wearing a blue towel is the, the, the bear or the plus the one that they give for the people who don't fit the regular the towel. The regular <laughs> towel. I was like, Oh my God. And then it was, I mean, Aggie loved it. And I thought it was funny too, uh, for a minute, but that, that and it was back with my drinking days. So then who knows what the rest of the night, but quite a fun show. And so now you toured this, yeah, that show had quite a lot of legs. Uh, my friend Esther Dack and I wrote that show for the Orlando Fringe Festival in 2006. Okay. Um, and I was I was going down the road, um, uh, driving down the road with a friend of mine who's actually a drag queen in New York now, uh, Charmaine Ultra. Mm. Um, and we were we were doing a show at the Fringe, and we were like, man, these shows that are selling out. They're they're the shows that have the catchy titles. Like, right. what would be a fun title that we could write? And we literally drove by the bathhouse in Orlando. And he was like, oh my gosh, bathhouse the musical. So we ran with it and wrote a 30 minute quick little musical. Like fabulous. Literally spit this music out in in a month uh, and submitted it. And it got accepted uh, into the fringe. And we ended up doing it. Um, and, and producers saw it and it played at the Parliament House for a bit. Um, and then it just took off. It 
It played in, um, we did a tour around the United States. It was in Canada for a while in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, it was picked up in London. It played in London several times. And it played in Paris. Uh, They translated it to French. Yeah. And it played in Paris for, I think, five or six months. Well, you've got handsome fellas dancing in towels and somewhat not towels. And then I did, is is the progression then that you went to your next musical? Am I correct? Well, we um, uh, from the 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 bathhouse musical running at the Parliament House, right? Um, I got a job running uh, the theater that was at the Parliament House. And so the, the Parliament House is yeah. is a club, is a theater, is a drag show, is yeah. a bathhouse, is what? all of it. <laughs> Not right? quite a bathhouse. Uh, well, it's a it's a hotel. Uh, where people yeah. meet and late at night it gets fun. We'll yeah, just say. yeah. It's, it's no longer there. It's now, I know, right? Now it's also a hole in the ground. Right. Um, well, <laughs> it's going to be condos. I think they're building on it. Um, but I was running the theater there, and uh, you know I like to make a splash. Um, so the first show that I produced uh, at the Parliament House was Naked Boy Singing. So right. we got the rights to produce that, uh, and that was so 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 successful. Um, that we decided, I teamed up with Ronnie Larson um, in Fort Lauderdale, and we did a national tour of Naked oh Boy Singing, gosh. too. Um, so now, I was, who was in the audience? Everybody. Yeah. I mean, mostly women, uh, gay men, no, women. Yeah. Uh, I think it depends on the city. Okay. Um, and, and we certainly did. We even did, in Fort Lauderdale, we did a nude night where the whole audience was nude. Oh, my God. Um and the, I think the cast was more nervous that night than any other night. Well, I mean, were. at that point, that's a, that's a, that a lot of people to compare yourself to. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. No. I get giggly. I am just, I have been, there was one time, well, I did, I did see that show, but I also, there was a time when I went to, um, Mr. Davis and I went to Canada and we saw male strippers. And I just was like, this is ridiculous. I can't, what, what is going on? How, you don't know where to look. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to look. And I've had my day with the stripper ladies, but the stripper men, I was like, this is silly. And I just laughed the whole time. Maybe because I'm interested. I don't know what the case may be. Well, I said to Mr. Davis, I was like, you go over there and you get a lap dance from that fella. Well, he did. And then I was mad. (laughs) (laughs) Early on in our relationship, I was like, that wasn't very open-minded. But um, yeah. So how did you handle all this? Or did it just become like... In and out of costume, or just all these people dancing around uh, naked. Oh, it became second nature to me, uh, and was so strange because the show ran for so long. Um, part of the audition process, right in you know Ripley Greer Studios, Pearl Studios in New York City, was okay. Cover up the windows. Time to take your clothes off and do the oh, dance call. Oh my! Uh, God. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, I, I I remember I would take. God, it's so creepy now to think back, but. We would have to take a shirtless Polaroid of each of them so we'd remember who they were. Just shirtless, top yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, just just hundreds of guys showing up to audition. And I'm like, okay, that was great. Now do it again with their clothes off. And, oh, my God. Well, I mean, again, <sighs> not what you teach with the students. Um, just a different <laughs> this, form of entertainment. A different life of yeah, mine a different before. Life. A different life. And so you made your way here into what brought you from Orlando to here. I mean, is it because the Parliament House closed? No, um, so it was the Parliament House closing. We, we jumped around a little bit, I think. The, the Parliament House closing is what sort of got me started at the um, with the college audition coaching. Right. You know, I, I just said at at this point, I um, I want to go back to to what I I do well and what I do right. Um, and I I really miss teaching and I like working with the kids. So it was then that I just said, you know what, I'm going to write this book I've been thinking about writing, which is on the college audition process. And once that book published, then I sort of got a um, a calling to do it, a calling, <laughs> got calls to do it n- on a national level. And and I still travel all over the country uh, teaching college audition classes and also vocal performance or vocal technique classes. Um, and then that that took off. Um, so the book came before the, the book came before me becoming an official college audition coach. Oh yeah, God, I love it. And the business really took off actually during the pandemic um, because we were already doing all of our coaching online via Zoom. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, um, our business exploded, which that was also that first year. Uh, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2020. Oh my gosh. I, we were gonna, I was yeah, wondering I, how we would transition. And so you were diagnosed yeah. and your business is thriving. Yeah. Um, so height of COVID, September right. of 2020, 
um, we were just able to start traveling again, really. And my, my husband or my boyfriend at the time um, said, let's go to uh, Seattle and visit our friend Cassie. And just, just before we left, uh, I had a doctor's appointment where I went into a gastroenterologist because I had an esophageal stricture, which my grandfather had often, where they just have to go in and do a balloon dilation to sort of stretch out your throat because um, I uh, was having trouble swallowing and was choking on food. Mm. Um, and so she, the very nice uh, gastroenterologist did it, and she said, you know, I didn't see any any issues, but while I was in there, I took a couple biopsies. I'll call you with a follow-up, um, but have a nice life. And then that Monday, we were waiting in line to uh, get on a whale-watching tour, and my phone rang, and it was the doctor, and and um, she just said, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but one of the biopsies I took um, came back with the cancer cells in oh it, gosh. and it was right at where your esophagus and your stomach meet, so right in that area. Um, she said, I didn't see a tumor, um, so I'm going to have you go see another doctor, and he can go in and look with an, um, a UV light. Um, so... Of course, vacation ruined. Of course. Um, so my friend Cassie, who was there with us, uh, went over to the booth and was like, I'm so sorry, we're not going to be able to get on. And these are expensive tickets. Right. And she's like, I'm, and she's literally standing next to a sign that says no refunds like this big. And she's, I could just hear her go, he just found out he had cancer. And I oh was like, gosh. oh my gosh. <laughs> Telling everybody. Well, we, we got a refund. You got your refund. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, a, a good business would do that. I mean, you literally yeah. just found yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I went home and the uh, other doctor went in and, and looked with the scope and said, yeah, you're, I see the tumor, you have cancer. Um, uh, and he said, we're going to do uh, EMR, an endoscopic mucosal resection, which is basically just going in and shaving off the top layer of your esophagus. Um, thinking, he said, that the, the tumor wasn't that deep. It's going to be, you know, going to be fine. They kept saying, everything looks everything great. Fine. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. Uh, so I went and had that done, and that was an outpatient thing. Literally went home the next uh, that afternoon, um, and she's like, "Yeah, it was perfect. We got it all. Have a nice life." Monday again. Damn Monday. She, I know she. That doctor called me on Monday and said the margins weren't clear. Um, I, I'm going to send you for a PET scan just to make sure that what we're seeing is true. Um, and if your PET scan lights up, then um, we're going to have to do an esophagogastrectomy. Um, went to have the PET scan, PET scan lit up. And so within two weeks of them telling me that, um, I went in and, and they did the esophagogastrectomy. They took out my entire esophagus and half my stomach. Oh my gosh. Um, and I didn't tell my mother until, until I was told I had to have that surgery. Everything, the first procedures and stuff, I didn't say a word. I didn't tell anybody. Right. Um, but then I had to tell my students and uh, my staff and, um, because I was going to be out for a while. Uh, that was, I had the surgery on October 22nd, um, and I was not human again. Um, I was, I was in the hospital for um, four weeks. Uh, and then I was on a feeding tube for two and a half months. Oh my God. I was back up and around by March. Um, March, I was finally able to like get out of the house. And the very first thing I did was we came up here and, uh, came up to Rochester Hmm. And I stopped and uh, actually went to several colleges. We we did a little tour, and I wanted to go see my kids. So I wanted to right. go see my kids at Baldwin Wallace, and I wanted to see my students here in Rochester. And um, yeah, what now? Wh th was this more from the surgery, or was, it, was there treatment as well that yeah. you had to do? Or I didn't have any chemo, no any chemo. radiation. They just cut it out. Okay, uh, and I was and cancer so free the day I left. Okay, um, but while I was in the hospital. This took me a long time to, this messed with me mentally, and it took me a long time. While I was in the hospital, the doctor came in one morning and said, so we, we examined the tissue that we removed, your, your esophagus and your stomach, we examined it, and there were no cancer cells there. So turns out they did get it in the first uh, EMR. Oh. Um, and the reason why the PET scan lit up was just from inflammation from that procedure. So, the, yeah. But, um, I mean, and that really messed with me because this basically took away six months of my life. And um, I I had to sort of wrap my brain around, well, this was the safest thing to do. It was this, the safest it thing. It saved yeah. my life. But I almost didn't have to do that. Um, 
and you know th- th- should i have gotten more opinions and blah you go you go through all of that right. because that it was just i lost 82 pounds in two months um it was it was a huge life change um and my my husband i didn't say this part the day after i found out i had cancer ricky proposed to me in in seattle oh and my <laughs> gosh was it was this the plan yes he's always planned on oh, proposing no. in seattle but one of the first things i said after he did it was are you just doing this because i have cancer <laughs> <laughs> like wait a minute are you just doing this yeah, but because- that's your dynamic that's yeah. it. i mean you have the similar dy- <laughs> dynamic that mr davis and i have where we're the show people and they're quiet steady right. consistent and so i'm i would assume the little minute, limited amount of time we spent together that he had a plan yeah, he did. Okay. But, you know, of course, me, I was thinking. Yeah. Did you just do this because you don't think, right. actually think it's going to happen? Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. make it to the wedding. <laughs> so you go through the I might not make it to the wedding stuff. You go through the depression. You go through, I mean, what were some of the tools to help you to to get through that time period? What what? And and were you also fearful that you weren't able to sing? Yeah. Of course. So um, the first thing you do always, and even though they tell you what not to do, is you Google. Um Dr. And, Google is oh just the worst. But um, esophageal cancer only has a survival rate of 5%. And that's true because by the time you have symptoms of it, mm. um, it's too late. Mine was stumbled on because I also had this stricture that was separate from the cancer. And so they just stumbled on it at a very, very early stage. Was the procedure that was done in some ways, would it be preventing you from anything in the future? If I ever get cancer again, it's not going to be esophageal right. because I don't have an esophagus. Right, right. Yeah. So obviously, like, it yeah. is, I don't know, is that, does that mean that it was a safe thing to do because yeah. of preventative? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so I there's still, acceptance there that maybe isn't easy to wrap your head around, but. I still get, you know, every six months I go and get a scan and blood work and everything to right. make sure that there's no um, cancer. They the, in, This incredible technology they have where they actually took DNA from my tumor, and now they check my blood to see if that same tumor DNA is in my blood um, to see if it's mm. come back, um, which is really great. And when we moved up here and started going to Roswell, um, they were, they're just fantastic. I, I've been very lucky to have great, great doctors the whole way through. Well, yeah. you, you've been a dreamer. You, you've taken chances. You've done things. Does, does, did that experience then make you say, like, F it. I'm going to do whatever I want, almost. Exactly. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, I, I hear myself saying often now to, to Ricky and to, um, I just interviewed for a board of directors position, uh, last week. And I said, you know, since my cancer, um, I don't just want to work for a paycheck. I want to work for an impact. Right. Um, you start thinking about what am I going to leave behind? Um, and, and is all of this stuff that I'm going through right now worth it? And, and what does it really matter? And, um, I find myself working more, um, more to to affect my students or yes. more to affect the people around me and i want to do good work i want to take you know what's what, what what's the good in working 60 80 hours a week if all you're getting is a paycheck from it mm-hmm. so i definitely have tried um to start in any way i can even from um doing work with with trans students now when i teach the voice classes and i'm, I'm traveling around the country i've added this uh, voice class specifically for trans students and um, I try to donate and give my time to LGBT organizations whenever I can and really trying to just be the person that I needed when I was growing up. Yes. And I know a lot of people say that, but no, but yeah. it mean it, you're doing it. I mean, yeah. you're doing it and, and with these students and your experience that you've had, obviously in the, in the LGBTQ plus community and finding ways, as you said, I, I, I personally did not experience cancer, but in my experience of, in my sobriety journey, when I hit that rock bottom place, it was this reality of like, oh, not only do I need to follow what I love, but I hope to make a difference. Yeah. And and that is really a lot of what this podcast is about. And you are doing that. You even have an upcoming uh, a scholarship yeah. at, at your at your high school. Yeah, I grew up at in this tiny little town south of Rochester called Honeyoy. 
Um, and right after moving up here, the there's a GSA in my school now, which I thought was incredible. I know, right? Woo! I know. And they invited me to um, speak to the GSA. And the GSA is Gay Straight Alliance, everyone. Gay Students Alliance. Or students. No. It was it's Gay students. Straight Alliance when we were younger, but it's Gay now students, it's students Alliance. Okay, thank you for correcting me. Um, and they invited me because I was Honeyoy's first gay. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> and that's literally how they announced me. Oh, uh, Actually, that is a pretty amazing yeah, title. They were like, well, I mean, I'm, I was the first out one, trust yeah. me. That lots came out yeah. in a sense. But uh, yeah, I, I spoke in front of them and they said this was the, the first out student at Honey Oi. And oh my gosh. I, came, I started my speech with, I thought there was going to be a statue. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I spoke to them and I was really inspired by um, uh, the, just the fact that there was uh, a GSA in my little tiny hometown now. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because as I went around the room, I, I actually sat in a circle with them and I said, okay, who are your parents? Who are your parents? Who are your parents? And I knew so many of their parents oh, I love that. from when I was growing yeah. up. I'm trying to and um, they all still spoke, uh, you know, about them experiencing homophobia in, in their school and, and transphobia. Um, and I just thought it was funny now because the people that were some of the teachers and things that, that are actually teachers that are showing a little bit of homophobia and transphobia just in what they do and they're, they're not being sensitive to things were my peers. So I was like, let me at them. Like, I'll go talk to them right, right. now because I went to Sometimes school Sometimes you just them. need the conversation. Yeah. Um, and they, they just didn't know better. So um, I became active in, in that. And I, I, I said to the person who was running that GSA that I wanted to somehow help. And he said that he was looking for... Um, he has, he has dreams for an, uh, a, a large organization that I hope to help make happen. Um, but he said that they're looking to possibly do a scholarship. And I just said, I'm on board. Right. So they're going to be giving at this year's high school graduation in June the Evanicki Equality Award for the first time. And applications are open now for Honey Oy, uh students. Um, and then once all the applications are in on April 14th, I'll be part of the panel that decides who gets that award. And it's for... A high school student who has, uh, for a, a graduating senior, who has during their time at Honeyoy gone out of their way to make it a more welcoming and friendly uh, place for not just LGBTQ plus students, but for BIPOC students as well. Because yes. that is not something that was around when I was there. Right. I was bullied terrible and um, just for being gay. And, and, and I, I, I'm a little terrified that that is still happening. Um, to the kids that are there, um, I think that's wild to me. Um, well, that it it's, still exists. It's still, it still exists and it still happens, but there, there are many other examples. There are many organizations that are coming up. There are opportunities for representation and, and you're leading the way in that. And Oh my gosh. I am very fortunate to say that we have created our business together uh, with our husbands Drag me to the stage that encompasses <laughs> drag me to brunch and encompasses shows that we're going to be putting on, such as the big wigs and yeah. uh, bringing in other talent. And most importantly, uh, you have really pushed and inspired me to, no. to 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 make some changes with those shows, but also so, so was, to start yeah. our cruise. The cruise and the cruise drag me to the sea. Drag me to sea, yeah. <laughs> Drag me to sea. Drag me to sea. And I'll tell you what, it's what a lineup that we've got yeah. so far. Of yeah, course, the sisters that we have here in Rochester, uh, myself, Ambrosia, Darian, Aggie, but Ethel. Carmen, uh, Carmen thank you so much, Carmen. Uh, Ethel in the can, who's a gal from Palm Springs, Sister yeah. Roma. I mean, we've got Dixie I'm Longgate. I'm cheating and at the list. Sorry. No, and, well, we've got people like uh, who have just signed in the last couple of days with yeah. uh, Cynthia Lee Fontaine. Cynthia Lee Fontaine just signed. Absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, you said Ethel yep. Jules Longbeach. Jules Longbeach, who Sister is Roma. essentially the uh, you know show director for all of the Hamburger Marys. Sister Roma out of San Francisco. Yeah. And we've we've got a couple that we we can't talk about because we're waiting to see if they're going to say yes. But we're we're they better say yes. They better say yes. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. It's the experience together. Yeah. It's uh, out of California. There's going to be a kickoff show and all the fun. And the cruise includes the booze, which back in my day, I mean, that's a deal. It is I mean, a deal. <laughs> it includes everything, not just the not just the drinks. It's the the premier or premium dining package, and you get Wi-Fi. All of your gratuities are included. 
And it's some pretty amazing destinations, not just for LGBT people, but you know, Los Angeles going, our very first stop is Puerto Vallarta. Excuse me, it's the Love Boat. It is the Love Boat. The Love Boat <laughs> destinations. It's, and I know that some of you, if you like me, you know what the Love Boat is. Come on, yeah. come on. So much fun. Yeah. So shows, obviously the excursions, the fun, the drinks, the food, the balconies, the fabulous sparkly blouses. We're going to have a grand old Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. So more to come on that. And of course, we'll we'll add the links. Okay, our time. I mean, we I could talk to you and, oh my goodness, and just look keep, at that. keep talking and talking and talking. I honestly want to reiterate how inspired I am. And this has been really just special because we're both go-getters and when we get together we have an agenda of things we've got to talk about but and and accomplish and and honestly what i love is hearing how important it is to make a difference for people in the world in ways that was that was not there for us and i appreciate that so much that you do that and that you foster that and that we've got great husbands who support us on this journey and even great dogs. I mean, our dogs got along. Our dogs did get along. I mean, Max is about, I don't know, 17 times bigger than your little fella. Just about. I yeah. mean, my gosh. We'll have to put, we'll put a picture up of we both will. of them. Uh, but <laughs> cute, the cutest. Okay. Dad jokes. Oh my you goodness. first. Which ones did you pick? I got, uh, why was 2019 afraid of 2020? Why? Because they had a fight in 2021. Oh my gosh. Very well, good. Everyone very is good. afraid of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do whales live in salt water? Hey, this is perfect for your story. Oh, why? Because Pepper makes them sneeze. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, and what is a witch's favorite subject in school? Grown spelling. Uh, <laughs> why do scuba divers fall backwards into the water? Why? Because if they fell forwards, they'd still be in the boat. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, too much fun. All right. Collect your sparkly uh, jackets because we'll have you back on again. Uh -huh. And we'll talk more about the cruise as we get more people uh, set to sail with us. And so again, thank you so That's much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here yes, today. Yes, thank you, thank you, really thank you. It. All right. Well, I hope you had a good time. Listen, movers, shakers, motivators, entrepreneurs. Tim is one of many that I am so fortunate to get to know. And I can't wait for you to share this podcast with your friends, wherever you podcast, or on the www on YouTube. We want to thank you so much for watching and listening. And remember, there's always time for kindness.